Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, so nice to be here. And today I'll be talking about Flutter up to up and the good, the bad, and the ugly parts of it. And a few words uh, about me first. Uh, so my name is Martin Hude. I'm a senior Flutter developer at LeanCode, Flutter Software Studio based in Warsaw, Poland. And for almost two years now, I have been playing a role of uh, Flutter tech lead at one of the major Polish banks. And uh, cooperation with this bank actually started as a proof of concept project using Flutter app to app technology. Uh, so that was like the main inspiration to, to give this talk. And I started mobile dev with React Native actually. Uh, been working uh, with it for a few years and then I switched to Flutter in 2020 and stayed with Flutter ever since. So uh, as developers, we all love new greenfield projects. Uh, we like to start everything from scratch. We like new projects typically because we don't have to deal with all that legacy code that was developed before we came to this project. Uh, but many companies would like to invest in Flutter in a cross-platform technology, uh, but they have already existing iOS and Android apps. And just doing a new project in Flutter is often not really an option, uh, but there is a way to, to go uh, around it and still use Flutter. So uh, there is this feature called Flutter Add to App. I don't know how many of you have used Add to App, either in production or, yeah, some of you. So for, for those of you who haven't heard about it before, it's basically a way to, uh, to either render part of the UI using Flutter inside a native iOS on Android app, or just run some shared that logic. Uh, you don't really have to render any UI. You can only render, uh, run some shared that logic. Uh, that's also possible. Uh, it's been in Flutter since Flutter 1.12, uh, which was released December 2019. So that wasn't there from the very start. It was added later uh, as like an additional feature. And uh, so that's basically uh, what that app is. And why would you actually want to use it? So uh, like the main reason is uh, that you would like to use Flutter for your app, but you cannot afford a full rewrite. So you cannot just uh, stop working on the existing app or start a new project uh, parallelly, because that would be too much of a cost. Uh, but what you can do is perform like a long-term migration. So uh, you start with some small piece of Flutter, inside uh, your native apps, then this, uh, this Flutter part can grow uh, bigger over time. Either you start writing new features exclusively in Flutter or start rewriting old features to Flutter. Uh, and in the end, you can end up with, uh, with a full Flutter app. And uh, there is also a talk later today uh, at uh, 3.15 PM by Kevin and Lucas. Uh, that shows actually a success story of such a migration. Uh, but uh, our project was a proof of concept and it was for a different reason. So uh, the stakeholders weren't really convinced that uh, Flutter is capable for a new big uh, banking project. Uh, so they figure out add to app is a way to, uh, to test this technology. And Flutter App uh, gives you a very nice way of uh, showing to stakeholders uh, that Flutter experience is comparable to native experience. So if, what you can actually do with Flutter App to App, uh, you can rewrite some screen uh, to Flutter and uh, give someone two phones, one with a fully native app and the other with native app with some screen using Flutter and uh, they probably won't be able to tell the difference if you've done it in a pixel perfect way. And you can go even further with that idea. So you can push it to production. You can run some A-B testing, some user testing. So that's like a very strong proof uh, to stakeholders that Flutter is a good technology for a new project. Some maybe more contrived example, but uh, it can also happen. 
is that you have some kind of reusable feature, some, uh, something that you want to use across different apps. And this can be both Flutter apps and some native apps. And here there's cross-platform uh, possibilities of Flutter and the reusability of the code can really shine. So uh, that's also an option when you can use Flutter at 12 because you can also support native applications. And in the long term, it can give you a nice cost effectiveness over time. So now you decided that for some of those reasons, you want to use a to app in your project. Uh, so how do you actually go about it? So first you, uh, you go to the documentation. There is a, a section uh, called add to an existing app. And uh, I have to say that docs have improved since we used them. Uh, they now also mention some more modern stuff like uh, Swift UI. Um, but something that you need to remember is that a to app is not the default way of building Flutter apps. Uh, so if you uh, stumble upon some problem during development, you are much less likely to find some, uh, some good resources on Stack Overflow and stuff like that. And in fact, if your app is huge, if uh, the app that you're trying to integrate is very big, uh, long maintained, uh, then probably uh, it won't be that simple as in the docs. And on the other hand, if your app is small, uh, then rewrite is probably a better option anyway. So, uh, so you need to remember that there is this overhead. So now let's get, get back to this uh, proof of concept with ours. Uh, so this was basically for uh, one of the biggest Polish banks. Uh, the app that we were dealing with was quite big. So it had half, half a million lines of code for iOS. 800,000 lines of code for Android. And we were asked to rewrite one complex business process. And uh, we wanted to prove that Flutter is capable for a new project. So uh, this was never a way to rewrite the whole app. The whole app stayed native, at least for the time being. Who knows what's going to happen in the future. Uh, but for now, it's a fully native app. But we started a new project from scratch in Flutter. And spoiler alert, it, the, the whole proof of concept was a success. So we, we, we now uh, publish this, uh, this fully Flutter app to production. So now let's take a look at how this Flutter app to app module looks like and what we actually have to think about before uh, going uh, with this technology. So one of the most important things uh, that can have a lot of impact on how you architecture your Flutter add to app module is navigation. So uh, let's look at this example. So basically we have a couple of native screens. You can navigate through them. And from one of those native screens, you can open a Flutter screen. And maybe from those Flutter screen, you can go to uh, another other Flutter screens. So basically you have like a Flutter module uh, that is a leaf uh, in this uh, whole navigation graph. So once you go to Flutter, you, you kind of uh, don't go uh, further into some new native flow. So you go from native to Flutter, then you're in Flutter. You can, of course, go back with back buttons or navigation gestures. Uh, but generally, uh, the Flutter module is self-contained. And now, Take, uh, now let's take a look at some different examples. So now we have a native screen, then we go to a Flutter screen, and then we can go either to a Flutter, another Flutter screen on, or a native screen. And uh, here from this uh, bottom native screen, we can go to another Flutter screen. So now we see that uh, we're kind of mixing native and Flutter views in the whole navigation path. And uh, that, that's the moment that we need to talk a bit about Flutter engines. So you don't really need to deal with Flutter engines when you're doing standalone Flutter apps. Uh, but with Add to App, it's a very important concept that you will uh, need to take care of a lot. Uh, so Flutter engine is basically a, a single execution environment for Flutter. And to render any Flutter UI or run any Dart code, you need to start an engine uh, in your native code, iOS or Android. And uh, 
if we look at this more complex path of navigation, so we can see that we basically have like two, two separate paths uh, that are separated by native screens. And uh, to go to this first Flutter screen in path A, we need to start an engine because we want to render a new Flutter view. So we need an engine. But then when we go to this native screen at the bottom and we want to start a new Flutter screen, we actually cannot reuse this old engine because this screen is still uh, below in the navigation stack and it needs to maintain its state. So when you go back, you actually uh, have the screen as you left it. And that's not really possible with one single Flutter engine. So in fact, in, in this case, you need two Flutter engines. And in more complex scenarios, you will need, you will need even more Flutter engines. So there are basically two principles with Flutter engines. So one is that initializing Flutter engine takes a lot of time. I mean, a lot. It's like a significant amount of time that you definitely don't want the user to wait before they see the screen. So uh, I'll show you some numbers later on, uh, how the performance like. Uh, but generally, you want to pre-warm those engines uh, before you uh, show a Flutter screen. Uh, so when to do that, it really depends on the application. So uh, you can do this right after the start. You can do this uh, after login, after entering some screen. Uh, you need to develop some heuristics for that. And when you're using multiple Flutter engines, there is a very nice uh, thing that was added in Flutter not that long ago, actually. I think it was uh, one and a half year or something like that. That's called Flutter Engine Group uh, that enables you to share resources. Uh, between multiple uh, Flutter engines. So starting a new Flutter engine will be faster and will use less memory. That's, so that's something that you definitely want to use. And also an interesting case uh, from our project, uh, also related to navigation, uh, was that we had this, uh, the native app used this kind of animation on the top bar. Uh, the standard iOS animation and we had a problem because uh, we wanted to, we had a native screen and then a couple of uh, Flutter screens. And uh, you cannot really, it's, I mean, it's very hard to synchronize those animation between native and Flutter screen. So when you have a native screen and then Flutter screen, then you could just use the native top bar and just render the Flutter part uh, that's underneath the top bar and then it's not a problem. But when you have multiple Flutter screens, then Flutter screens will use a different, uh, will use its own animation uh, between those two screens. And then it gets really messy, basically. And actually, we didn't figure out a full-on solution for that. And in the end, we just rewrote more screens to Flutter because we decided it's just easier to, <laughs> to increase like the scope of this module rather than to try to work around this issue. But that's something that's hard to predict, actually, when you start, uh, start a new project. And now let's talk a bit about the UI. So we all love UI in Flutter because it's a very nice experience to write UI development code uh, in Flutter. And with add to app it's basically the same. So once you start working with widgets, uh, it's really the same, the same declarative manner of writing UI code. So nothing's really different from the developer perspective. Uh, but there are some other things that you need to think about. So, uh, so typically, when you have a big native app, uh, the iOS app was, will have some set of reusable UI components. The Android app will have the same uh, set of reusable UI components from buttons, checkboxes to some more complex components. And basically when you want to have uh, like the same consistent experience for users uh, in the Flutter app to app module, you will end up having to rewrite those. So now you have to maintain three implementations of those components. So when the designers want to change something, you need to change it now in three places. 
And it's even worse when you when the UI uh, when the UI on iOS and Android is different, which is something that you should actually avoid if you use Flutter, uh, because Flutter is meant to render the same thing. But for there might be some differences that you don't want to uh, that you don't want to standardize at this point. Maybe some later. Okay, so that's for generic UI components. Now, what about assets? And there's basically, because you also, uh, your app is also using some icons, images, maybe some animations in JSON. So basically, uh, can we reuse those native assets uh, so, uh, so we don't put them in the binary twice? And there is a good news and bad news about this. So the good news is that it's, uh, it's possible on iOS. There is, plat uh, there is a package called iOS Platform Images. And the bad news is that it's not yet possible on Android. There is an open issue. Uh, it's technically possible, but uh, there is like no out-of-the-box solution for now. Um, and also an interesting idea is that you don't have to rewrite everything. So in fact, something that's also possible uh, is that you can reuse some native subviews inside a Flutter view. So that requires some boilerplate uh, with defining platform views and stuff. But in case of some more complex UI components, uh, that's also an option. And in fact, doing it the other way is also possible. So you can have uh, a native screen with some Flutter subviews, but those subviews now will have to use separate Flutter engines. So, but that's also something that, that you might want to think about. You might have a good use case for that. And now let's talk about uh, networking because there's a high chance that the, the Flutter module that you're going to write uh, is not going to be a dump module just to render some UI, but it's also going to uh, fetch some data from the backend or send some requests. And uh, there are basically two ways to do it. And the first way is that uh, when you have the existing uh, native implementation, then why not use it? So we have some native API client uh, built on top of some HTTP client or maybe some other protocol. Uh, and you basically can bridge every request uh, from the Flutter module to the native part using method channels. And the advantage of that is that you don't have to rewrite all those endpoints and models, but also maybe you can generate them. So then this argument doesn't really hold. Uh, the authentication logic is handled inside the native app and basically transparent to Flutter. So you don't have to bother with refreshing tokens, setting some common headers, maybe some cookies, stuff like that. Uh, of course, there will be some performance overhead with that because you need to call the native code and you still need to implement and maintain this bridge, which can also be uh, quite large uh, when the, the amount of uh, Flutter code you're writing is starting to grow. And the other idea is just to use Dart HTTP client and build on top of it uh, a Dart implementation. Uh, but you will still need, uh, still have some places where you need to synchronize with the native API client. Uh, basically, it's, uh, as I said, refreshing tokens, for example. So the native code can uh, use some request queue, stuff like that. Um, so now we no longer have this extra overhead uh, for further native communication. Uh, Flutter devs have full control over the API uh, layer. Uh, so we're no longer in this producer-consumer uh, relationship. Uh, we'll, we'll now have to rewrite all those endpoints and models, but again, maybe we can uh, code gen them. Um, and this whole part of synchronizing state can actually get very tricky uh, in case of big, bigger apps, uh, which might have some custom implementation and stuff like that. Okay, so now let's talk a bit about uh, is the whole developer 
developer experience impacted by writing a two app. And a uh, few like conclusions from what we did uh, in our project is that the whole development setup, setup might not be straightforward in a corporate setting. So being this a bank, this is not strictly related to add to app, but it's relating to using new technology uh, in a big corporate. Uh, so uh, they used a lot of proxies, VPNs, artifact management solutions. So actually before we could start uh, writing any Dart code, it was like a few weeks of uh, unblocking some, uh, some network issues, setting up uh, artifact management to support pub. So that's something also that uh, kind of gives a huge overhead on such a project. So when you're doing the estimation, it's worth including uh, such things. And uh, the working on the UI, as I said, it's really great. Something that's also interesting, you can run your Flutter module as a standalone Flutter app. So you don't actually have to run the native app uh, to render those Flutter screens you're developing. You can also do this in isolation. Of course, if you're using some native stuff, some method channels, you will have to mock them. But for UI development, this can be very nice. Uh, we had to debug natives up a lot, so uh, knowing Android Studio and Xcode really is necessary for that. And with multiple Flutter engines, uh, we actually had a lot of problems with debugging, so the debugger wouldn't always attach. Uh, with one engine, it was fine, but when we moved to multiple engines, then it started to get a uh, very shaky experience. Okay, so another thing. So how do we build this actually? So we have a pipeline for building native apps. How do we add Flutter? So again, there are two ways basically. One is to treat Flutter as an artifact. Uh, so here we can use Flutter build AAR a command which builds a Maven repository with AAR. We can then link it to the native project. Uh, on iOS, we can use Flutter build iOS framework, which actually builds a bunch of Xcode frameworks, one for Flutter, one for your app code, uh, one for each plugin that uses native code, and also some Flutter plugin registrant, which registers all those plugins. And you can add those as embedded uh, frameworks in Xcode. So of course, the main advantage is that native devs don't have to install Flutter on their machines. You can just provide a compiled binary. You don't need to modify uh, the whole CI. Uh, at the beginning of the project, we just uh, put build binaries in the Git repository which is of course not a long-term solution, but to just to start working with this, it's really fine. Um, and a more streamlined solution is to treat Flutter as code. So basically use Cocoa Pods to link to the Flutter code, use Gradle to uh, link Flutter code to Android. Uh, you can include Flutter module as a Git sub module, for example. Um, and this is a more streamlined solution. Uh, good for the long term, but devs will need to install Flutter locally to be able to do that. And you also need to use Cocoa Pods because I think that's the only uh, package management solution for iOS that's directly supported by Flutter. Uh, so that can also be an issue in some projects that don't use Cocoa Pods. And now a few words about native code because uh, the general conclusion is that you will native knowledge to do add to app. Flutter native communication is really unavoidable. You will have to write some method channels, do some communication. And uh, I highly recommend you the pigeon package if you need to do this. So this is basically like a contract generator uh, where you write some, j just some schema in Dart. And this will generate uh, plugins for, uh, I mean, uh, some clients for iOS, Android, and Dart. So we will, you will just have to call methods uh, and you can get some models that you define uh, in the schema file. And that, that saves up a lot of time. 
you can also use all packages that are available on PAP uh, if you're using a 2 app. That also includes uh, packages that use native code. So you can, for example, include a camera package in your Flutter app to app module. Uh, the fact that you're integrating with the native app uh, doesn't mean that you cannot uh, use any native code written by Flutter developers. There are some caveats, uh, though, to that. So the main one is that uh, if you have a package that contains native code, which we call plugin in the, the Flutter world typically, uh, you can, and this plugin uses some, uh, some native library, and your app also uses this library, they need to have the same version because in the end, the, the Gradle and iOS will have to use a single version of the library. And that can be a problem if there is a version mismatch there. So you will either have to upgrade the plugin or your native app. So plugin might be easier, but uh, it's something, some extra work to do. And something that's interesting about uh, our project, which is I think is not that typical uh, for add to app scenarios, is that the feature that we re-implemented using Flutter was using some background processing. So a, a simplified diagram of our architecture uh, looks like this. So uh, we had a native screen. Uh, from the native screen, uh, we could open like the main Flutter module with a couple of screens. And some action performed of one of those screens needed to start like a background processing logic, which, is ca which in case of Android was run inside a foreground service. iOS used background tasks, which is uh, a much simpler implementation. Uh, but basically we needed to start uh, a dark background isolate, uh, which would run in background, and then it could start another further screen. Uh, so we basically had three engines here, uh, those isolates, they can communicate with each other using messages. Uh, and we could use, reuse the native code to do that, so because we had the native implementation of the services. Uh, but we wanted to prove that we can actually re-implement the whole logic in Dart. So the whole uh, business logic, which was like a huge state machine, uh, was actually uh, re-implemented in Dart. So we ended up with pure Dart code for business logic and only some, some infrastructure code that was uh, Kotlin and Swift. Few words about app size, because adding Flutter will have an impact on your final binary. Uh, in our case, it was 27 megabytes for iOS. It was 48 megabytes for APK, including our architectures. Uh, and also an interesting story was that the native app uh, was still being uploaded to, to the Play Store in APK format, which is not, now not allowed for new apps. But uh, when you have an old app, uh, it was still possible. Now we have to use uh, AAB, Android App Bundle. Uh, so actually, uh, when we show them the numbers, also uh, how big of an impact it would be on the existing app even without Flutter, uh, just moving to AAB. Uh, the whole company like started transition to AAB. And with AAB, the, the increase was 15 megabytes, so that wasn't that bad. Uh, what about performance? So uh, those are some numbers from the official Flutter documentation. Uh, the numbers will vary depending on the device you're using. Uh, so they're pretty rough but they're the order of magnitude that you might expect. Uh, so on iOS, engine pre-warm, as I said, it, you should do it in the background, uh, takes around 860 milliseconds, and rendering the first frame, 320. And the uh, further frames will be, will be very fast, but rendering just the first frame takes some more time uh, uh, right after starting the engine. And on Android, it's one and a half second for engine pre-warm and 200 milliseconds uh, for the first frame. And memory consumption, uh, engine pre-warm on iOS allocates 22 megabytes of memory. Uh, 
uh, first frame 16 megabytes and uh, on Android 42 megabytes for the Android Preworm and 12 megabytes for the first frame. You might be doing UI testing in your app. Uh, so the good news is that you can still run all your existing native tests after you add Flutter, uh, because that doesn't really have any impact. Of course, if you rewrite, uh, if you have tests that touch the screens that you uh, rewrote to, to Flutter, uh, then you will have to use some uh, Flutter testing tool, ideally. Um, one of those tools is uh, Patrol, developed by Linkode. If you want to uh, know, learn some uh, more things about it, we have a booth here, uh, uh, downstairs, booth number seven. Uh, what's nice about Patrol is that it has the full native automation and Patrol tests actually run as native tests. So all the tooling that you use for your UI tests uh, for the native part will just, uh, Patrol will uh, just add new tests uh, to that native tooling. Uh, so that won't break anything. And we mostly focused on some technical stuff here, uh, but there are also some other issues. So uh, the, the technical stuff is not the only thing that we have to deal with when we're building products, especially big products. So. The, the, I think the, the, the thing that you realize uh, when you're for, uh, faced with such tasks as rewriting something is that the code that you're going to rewrite will have a lot of technical debt. So you will have to deal with legacy code. Uh, it might, there might be no documentation for how those features work. It was our case, so there was no official documentation or analysis how any of this worked. And we needed to figure out it from the native code. Uh, we, and we also had no designs in modern designs tools like uh, Figma, for example. So you basically had, have to, may have to measure pixels yourself uh, from the native screens to re-implement them in a picture-perfect way. And native source is your ultimate source of truth. So if you want to rewrite your app you, and you want, to, uh, you want to make sure that it works the same way uh, when, be, when wrote in Flutter, uh, you, will have to, uh, you will have to read a lot of native code and it may be code of uh, bad quality, but some legacy code in Java and Objective-C. Uh, so that's something uh, really that you have to remember. And you will need expertise in both Flutter and Native. Uh, so it's best to have some senior developer that's experienced uh, in both Flutter and Native technologies uh, because you might be a, a great Flutter dev, great with Dart, uh, but you really will need to uh, uh, integrate with a lot of native stuff here. And something that's also you will have to deal with on a more of a soft skill level is that not everyone might be fond of Flutter. So you'll be dealing with teams of native developers that really love their framework. Uh, they may be reluctant to switch to Flutter. Uh, they might not see it as an opportunity, uh, but as an attack to their technology, to their jobs. So that's something that you really need to handle carefully. Uh, and also with the rise of Swift UI, Jetpack Compose, uh, this kind of declarative UI advantage, uh, that was always a, a huge selling uh, argument for Flutter, doesn't really hold anymore that much. Uh, so it will, will be harder to convince them uh, to Flutter in that part. And uh, some final takeaways from all of this. So, first of all, every project is different. Uh, so, I think I've said it depends many times during this talk as a good consultant, uh, but it really is true. So, uh, every project is different when you're dealing with uh, big native apps uh, and you won't be able to predict uh, all obstacles 
that you will face along your path to, to the flutter world. And uh, you should, my general advice would be to try to isolate the flutter module as much as possible and just let, let flutter shine with what it does best. So that's basically the UI. And uh, add to app brings some issues that will not appear in a standalone Flutter app. Uh, you should not only focus on the technical stuff, but also on some other factors like uh, organization structure, uh, technical debt, lack of documentation. Um, and it's always good to consult someone experienced uh, who used Add to App in a big project uh, because they can give you an insight of what you might expect in some more complex scenarios. And a little advertisement. Uh, we have this ebook, uh, Flutter from Enterprise. It also includes my article about Add to App, uh, along with some other great articles. So feel free to check this out. Uh, as I said, there is uh, another talk today about Add to App, uh, which I highly recommend. It's about uh, migration path uh, for fully uh, rewriting uh, an app to Flutter. And thank you a lot of. Thank you a lot for, for listening. Uh, I don't know, do we have time for some questions?